My name is Cathy Hunt and I'm the executive producer of the WOW Women of the World Festivals in Australia. In April this year, the first of three WOW Australia festivals was due to take place in Brisbane and of course was cancelled as a result of the pandemic. At the event, we were going to celebrate the fact that 2020 is the international year of the nurse and midwife. And one of our guests was to be the secretary of the Queensland Nurses and Midwives Union, Beth Mole, also a director of one of our strategic partners, Q Super. I caught up with Beth for a virtual coffee and a chat and started by asking her what the key messages were that her and her colleagues had hoped to pass on to audiences about their professions had the festival gone ahead. Yeah, Cathy, it's, it's hard to even think back that far, isn't it, really? So much has happened since uh, we were all getting prepared for WOW on the first weekend in April, and it just seems like such a distant memory. But I guess the same themes apply. I mean, what we were wanting to talk about was the fact that nurses and midwives are there for people when they need them, at their, when they're at the most vulnerable, when they really need them, and the contribution that nurses and midwives make day in, day out. It is the International Year of the Nurse and the Midwife. The World Health Organization had declared that. So uh, it really is quite um, astounding, really, that the COVID-19 crisis has happened at the same time that actually underscores the fact that nurses and midwives are so pivotal, are so central to keeping people safe. And we've seen from the numbers of nurses and midwives and other health workers who have died overseas as a result of COVID, just how um, important that role is and how our members put themselves at risk at extreme times like this. So we're going to be celebrating the value and contribution of nursing and midwifery. And we had a whole year planned out. So WOW was part of it, but we had every quarter of the year, we had different themes planned out for the year with um, International Day of the Midwife Week coming up on the 5th of May and International Nurses Day on the 12th of May. We had so many celebrations planned uh, and WOW was part of that. It was going to be kicking it off, a very big um, part of kicking off the year for us. And then, of course, along came COVID-19 and What's happened is that our members have had to um, celebrate by doing. So part of me is a bit cranky about that, is saying, couldn't we just have some time to just stop, pause, reflect, and think how important a contribution nurses and midwives make? Instead, what we're doing is that we're demonstrating that on the world stage right now. Yes, yes. And you're going to talk, from what I remember, you were talking very, very much about the notion of how we value. And, and, the, and it was very yeah. linked very much for, for, from a WOW perspective about the valuing or non-valuing, particularly of, of women's work and, and, and the work of caregivers. Yes, and that was going to be very much our focus is the fact that more often than not, the work of nurses and midwives is unseen. It's not until people... Um, uh, require um, a nursing and midwifery a care that they appreciate it. It's when people are at their most vulnerable. And so quite often, once people do experience it, they realise how important the contribution is. But more often than not, it's not until, you know, times are tough and uh, that nursing and midwifery care is needed uh, that people appreciate that. I mean, we do know that the community generally has got a very high regard for nurses and midwives. And since um, since we were included in the um, review that um, um, Morgan uh, News Poll does every year about who are the most res respected and trusted professions, uh, nursing has topped that every year since it's been included in that survey. So we do know that there's an appreciation at one level but really, the way that the work is valued um, is not appropriately done. I mean, it's not seen. More often, it's not seen. And it's in, important to reflect upon this in the COVID context, too, as well. If you have a think about it, the roles that um, the community is relying on now is not only nurses and midwives, but other predominantly female professions like teachers, yep. um, people who are working um, in, uh, in services such as retail, keeping our shops going, and those essential services to people who are keeping our community going, it's predominantly women's work, you know. So not hedge fund managers, for example, it's not people like that or others who um, quite often, you know, um, uh, valued and uh, and get the monetary rewards. Um, uh, nurses and midwives certainly aren't in it for uh, the monetary rewards. It's in it for intrinsic value, but they do want their worth 
valued appropriately um, through through appropriate remuneration and workloads, things like that, being able to have the ability to keep people in their care safe by having the right number and skill mix of people caring for them is really important to our members. So we wanted to have a really good conversation about unpacking valuing and what that means in WOW. So again, we've got an opportunity to do that now in the COVID context because we're wanting to now that we're moving to a stage that uh, we're thinking about getting back to normal, whatever that will look like, um, we have an opportunity to see what is the role of nurses and midwives in doing that. And our members have really stepped up in terms of doing things fundamentally differently in uh, providing community-based services and actually going out into people's homes, running virtual wards, a whole lot of different things. That's what, it's really, if you like, being on steroids to a certain extent. We wanted to talk about that at WOW, and now we've been able to just do that um, uh, in, in real time uh, during this crisis. So uh, I guess we wanted to have the opportunity to talk about it, to reflect about it, and to actually communicate that. And we had such a great panel lined up of, of nurses and midwives very experienced nurses and midwives, but um, people who are newer to the professions too, as well. A great panel we had lined up to talk about, you know, why these women got into nursing and midwifery, why it's important to them, what the nature of the work is that nurses and midwives do day in, day out, and the value of that from a very personal perspective. Um, so that's what we we're wanting to do in the panel, but now um, we're doing it on a daily basis. Do it on a daily basis. And I think, I think one of the other things that you were going to move into very much in that value idea was, was around the holistic nature of medicine and caring and where nurses sit within that and where that fits within perhaps the difference between how it works as opposed to how it's funded and how policies and society think it now works and where the power structures yeah. lie within that. Oh, well, there's going to be a fundamental examination of power within the health system uh, because it's riddled with power imbalances. And unfortunately, the people who quite often have the least amount of power are the people who we're caring for in the system. So nurses and midwives have a critical role to play in terms of uh, the advocacy role and the navigation role in health and aged care, a really, really vital role that we play there. So it was going to be a bit of an unpacking of that in terms of the nature of health and how, unfortunately, as much as we pay a bit of lip service to it, our health and aged care system are not really person-centred. They're not really designed around the needs of the people who we're delivering the care services to. They're delivered more often than not around the system's needs and what's efficient for the system or what's efficient for providers of the system. So we need to fundamentally flip that on its head and really genuinely put people back at the centre of the system. And I mean, I think that there's a number of challenges we've got in health and aged care right now. Uh, one is that our funding model is fundamentally broken. So we're absolutely just um, uh, widgetizing, if you like, healthcare. I mean, we're, we're providing um, uh, funding on the basis of episodes of care and it's very fragmented. It's not actually looked at in a way that there is coordination of care across settings, acute, primary and preventative healthcare. There's not enough focus on prevention. So the funding model is fundamentally broken and needs to be fixed. Our governance model in healthcare is fundamentally broken too as well, and we need to be thinking about how we structure our, um, our health services, health and aged care services, and how we're accountable to the community for the services that we provide. And that's really important that we have um, public reporting of um, health outcomes and uh, where healthcare services are provided and the like. So we need to do some really important fundamental work to actually make that more visible to the community and make ourselves more accountable through public reporting. And the last point is, yeah, as I said yeah. before, power imbalances in healthcare. We've got to deal with the nature of the power imbalances in healthcare. So again, that's the three sort of themes we're going to be talking about on our panel in WOW too as well. They're very important themes that we have to keep on coming back to. The, the other, so obviously you were going to, and you talk about that beautifully in the essay that you've written for Griffith Review. Um, and you were going to be, I think, dealing very much with that issue, with the issue of um, women and ageing and healthcare 
on the second panel, uh, which was all about uh, the fourth quarter and what happens to us as we, <laughs> you and I have yeah. the same birth year, I know this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what happens to us as we move into the into the fourth quarter? Um, but you would you also go and, and that's a great essay, and that's that that I believe is going to be. Uh, released with the Griffith Review released this week um, and, and, and it's entitled Systems Failure so I, I really will urge everybody to read that but also within that essay you bring bring in into that your experience in, in one of your other roles uh, that you've had over over a long period of time and that's been as a director on two superannuation funds and yeah. you talk in particular about the issue the bit the big issue one of the other big issues pre-covid issues but we'll come back again about women in super and the stats around that perhaps you can just briefly talk about that yeah, it seems like a lifetime ago that I wrote that Griffiths <laughs> Review article. I've got to say, so much has happened since then. But the issues are still um, very much front of mind. And they're very much front of mind because the federal government has enabled people in financial hardship circumstances to take out $10,000 per year over two years from their superannuation account balances, which absolutely makes my blood boil because women are already under superannuated as it is. Uh, and that's because of the breaks that women have during their uh, working lives from paid work to care for children and for other family members and because um, more often than not they're um, working part-time and uh, they because of the gender pay, pay gap as well there's a, a fundamental balance so women on average retire with a balance about 40 percent less than what a man would um, uh, uh, and that's just a structural uh, problem within our superannuation system that we have to address. So that was going to be a particular focus of mine in the other panel because it's something, as you say, I'm very, very passionate about. I've been on superannuation fund boards now for almost 20 years and it's something that um, uh, is really linked to my day job as Secretary of the Nurses and Midwives Union because um, I see very much the advocacy role that I play on a day-to-day -day basis you know, in, in healthcare and, and, and our, uh, looking after our members in healthcare expands to when they retire too as well and so many of our members retire with a totally inadequate um, retirement income so we really do need to be reframing our thinking around uh, retirement incomes too as well so we have to address the pitifully um, uh, lower superannuation balances that women uh, retire on. So there's a, a piece there around uh, uh, addressing uh, the gender pay gap that we have to uh, do so much work and that's work that we do in my day job as Secretary of the Nurses and Midwives Union too as well in terms of making sure that our members are remunerated appropriately. But we need to be thinking not, a, not only about the retirement income, we have to rethink our retirement income system in my view. Very much so it can't just be only about the superannuation component which is incredibly important. We have to be thinking about how that intersects with our pension system but also with our health and aged care system and with housing, issues like housing. So those sorts of issues, I mean, the greatest determinant of poverty in old age for women is not owning their own home, not actually being in secure, affordable housing. So I think it's really critical that we rethink retirement. And it's very, very important for women to do so, given that we, compared to our male, male counterparts, are, are under superannuated. So it's something I'm very passionate about because um, not only do we have the gender the pay gap that we suffer through our working life, our work, our, the worth of our work is not appropriately valued. That plays out in retirement too, as well. And as we know, women live longer than men too, as well. So there's particular challenges associated with that in terms of making our retirement income last for longer. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I mean, a huge subject. Which even, I mean, it's not only just rethinking retirement, but it's also rethinking the whole issue of financial literacy. Um, because yep. this starts, this should be starting, it's almost, it's starting in school. And I think, you know, I mean, I will, I will acknowledge that um, obviously Q Super um, is one of our major sponsors for the festival and the work that Q Super, you, you and others at Q Super have been doing and looking at that stages of women's lives yeah. as to what you need to know through each stage of your life before you get to the problems of retirement, because often it's that that has led to the way the women women's position at, at, at retirement age. 
You're right, Kathy. We need to be thinking about where are the different touch points in women's lives that we actually, the moments that matter, if you like, yes. where they make fundamental decisions that will impact upon uh, their financial security throughout their life. So not only in retirement, but throughout their whole life. So we really do have to do a lot more work about engaging with women about those moments that matter, whether, as you say, it starts at school, it starts in terms of uh, building in confidence and, and the skills around financial literacy. So it starts there. But it's also the case that when you've got a new graduate nurse or midwife, you know, coming into the workforce, engaging with them in their orientation when they first start work to say that, you know what, it can make a hell of a difference to you if you start salary sacrificing into super now. And the impact that will make, the, the, the power of compounding interest, if you like, the impact that will make over your lifetime is just so phenomenal. But if we make it easy for people to understand those messages and just at different points in their life, so it's when they start work, but it's also when they might be taking time off to have children or to care for, for, for um, and, you know, elderly relatives, you know, what they can do to actually enhance their financial security going forward. We really do need to be concentrating on those moments that matter and connecting with women during their lives in those moments that matter to give them the advice that they need to make really good decisions. Obviously, I think on behalf of all of us, we want to acknowledge um, all your members and the work that they are doing during this time. Um, and it, it's just appalling that it is the international year of the nurse and midwife. But I think it's important for us to acknowledge all frontline workers. Um, from a personal point of view, my sister and her husband are both nurses in the UK, um, in the aged care system as well. Um, so I'm feeling that and um, knowing about that uh, in a in perhaps a, a much worse place than we have actually managed to get to yeah. here. So um, uh, thank you to all of you and everything uh, that you're doing uh, because it's, I think it has come into its own. But we're all talking at the moment, and, and I'm sure you are as well, about what have we learnt? Not what have we learnt just because of the pandemic and how we how we should be controlling um, things like this when they happen. But what has this moment in time um, made us think about the world we're living in, the issue of value, and what we want to see change as we come out of this? What changes do you absolutely want to see happen? Yeah, I think there's so many lessons out of this, Cathy. There's so many lessons that just even having the time at home <laughs> to reflect yes. upon what really matters to people, you know, the importance of relationships, the importance of the small things in our life, you know. Yeah. Uh, I think that they are, they are, on a personal level, there's some really important lessons that we can all learn. But I think that there's the really important lessons for me is the fact that I think that Queensland in particular, but Australia, uh, you know, has been a world leader, I think, in terms of the response um, uh, to COVID, uh, along with our, our colleagues across the ditch in New Zealand. Um, we've done things a bit differently. Uh, and the importance of social solidarity and the, you know, the approach that we take in our culture, um, it's not only about, um, you know, rampant individualism, we're there for each other and when the chips are down. And uh, it's a great thing that we've been able to put ideology aside in terms of things like the national cabinet and be focused on what the common interest is. Yeah. And I really hope that we can continue to do that where we've got other challenges confronting us like the existential threat of climate change, for example. So I'm hoping yeah. once COVID-19 passes us, that we'll be able to apply the same approach and rigour to other problems that we've got that we have to solve together. And so I think, think people, yeah. Do you think people are linking the two things? I mean, we talk, we've been talking about this is very much it is absolutely linked in that uh, it is that the causes it causes are very much to do with the impact that we have made on the earth or the impact that has come from us and the way we treat animals and the way we've been looking at that this is where these things tend to come from is where human interaction with the earth falls over the balance has completely yeah. gone the, the other way and do you th there is a link there between what we're doing and how we, we yeah. are a much more sustainable um, planet uh, as well as community. Yeah. I think that some are making that connection more than others, but I think that everybody is making um, uh, a connection and, and reflecting upon what's important to them and yeah. uh, what we need to be doing 
uh, to make our lives more sustainable and more fulfilling. You know, I think that it is think something that we're all really grappling with in terms of getting off the treadmill, stopping breathing and reflecting uh, upon those matters. I think that that's a really important um, outcome of this particular pandemic is that we're, we're thinking about what really matters to us and what we value. And I think one example is, is the fact that, you know, when did we become a country that doesn't manufacture things that matter anymore? I mean, the fact that there's a worldwide shortage of personal protective equipment or PPE for health workers, that's really something that we need to be reflecting upon is that we need to be make, continuing to make things that matter. I mean, those just-in-time supply chains, uh, those, um, that um, relentless drive for efficiency, that relentless drive for, for just um, uh, the cheapest cost um, uh, um, and making sure that we uh, get that. Redundancy is an important thing <laughs> to have at times like this. I mean, I think we should be thinking about investing in redundancy and investing in making sure that we We've got uh, an adequate, a, a guaranteed supply of the things that matter to us. And so I think that there's as a nation, we need to be doing a bit of reflecting upon the fact that, you know, what's happened with our, our um, real um, obsession with trickle-down economics in the last couple of decades and efficiency for its own sake and not really concentrating on um, what keeps us safe and connected as a community, not as, a, as an economy. And the economy, of course, is, is very, very important. But the great thing about this pandemic is the fact that we put the health needs of the community first above the economic response. And I think that that's an incredibly, um, an incredibly valuable thing for us all to celebrate, really, is the fact that we saw that that was the most important thing to do, is to keep everybody safe. And, you know, the one word that keeps on coming up, if you have a look at this, together, you know, together we can get through this, together we will keep each other safe, together we've each got a role to play. It's not just about rampant individualism, it's our connections and our social cohesion that will see us through um, in this crisis. So it does have... Yeah, you also feel that, I mean, I, I, I hear what you're saying about the together, but I sometimes think that, you know, what this crisis has also done is actually show us where the great divisions are in our yeah. society. Yeah, it um, does. It highlights it. Uh, with everybody yeah. and who's suffering, who's suffering and how is very, very clear. Yeah, it does yeah. absolutely um, um, show the fault lines up. It does demonstrate um, that we're probably we're not as an equal society as we like to think that we are. But we've at least come together and said that our you know one of the most important things that we've got as a symbol of social solidarity in this country is our universal healthcare system, and what sets us apart from a country like the USA. And we've we've had to do an ad for this for our members to actually remind them that we're not the USA. We have got a world class universal healthcare system where people access care not based on their capacity to pay, but on their needs, their healthcare needs. So we need to be celebrating those symbols of our social solidarity. Um, yeah. And and that's a really important thing to reflect on. But you're quite right, it's not perfect. And we've got so much room for improvement. And I very firmly believe that nurses and midwives have a critical role to play in, in fulfilling that, in actually closing that gap between yeah. the haves and have not to have better coordinating care across primary and preventative and acute care sectors. I think that there's a critical role that we can play because after all, nurses and midwives are there for you 24-7, you know, across yeah. all types of settings and, um, you know, we're the linchpins of the system. Um, and I think that uh, we're really up for the challenge of doing things fundamentally different post-COVID. Great. Or as we, we, we said in our title for the WOW panel, um, from the cradle to the grave. And I think... Uh, yeah. I think it's um, as you said. You've um, you do, you weren't able to talk about it at while, but you've you've been out there demonstrating it <laughs> for the last few weeks, or exactly. So um, yeah. thank you so much for taking the time, Beth. Is, is there anything else that you haven't you anything you you haven't spoken about that you want to put in that we can fit in somehow? Oh no, just so just like so how very proud I am of nurses and midwives around the world and the effort that they are making right now to keep our community safe. It just does demonstrate that 
they put the needs of others uh, ahead of their own needs. And sometimes that's a great um, risk to them personally and to their families. And so that's why personal protective equipment is such a potent symbol of, of this crisis, is the fact that we need to be making sure that nurses and wives and other healthcare workers, whether they're doctors, allied health, admin, operational support people, that they have got access to personal protective equipment. If we don't keep our healthcare workers safe, they can't keep everybody else safe. So it's really... Um, incredible proud moment for me to actually just reflect upon the work that our uh, nurses and midwives are doing around the world and unfortunately some of them have paid um, the cost with their life and um, we'll be reflecting upon that tomorrow is um, uh, sort of the, the day that we we celebrate or reflect upon um, uh, those workers who have had paid the ultimate price uh, in, in a Workers' Memorial Day. And, and this year, um, it is uh, health workers who are front and centre because so many of them have uh, have paid the ultimate price around the world. And we just need to be uh, reflecting upon that and just uh, doing all that we can to keep our healthcare workers and frontline staff safe at this uh, challenging time.